this is an artificial breakdown. We are one person, okay? And it's very important to interact with someone as a whole person. And we tend to separate it for convenience, and I've done the same thing because it's much easier to explain when it's broken down into parts. But it's important to remember uh, that we are simply one whole person, okay? And that the components um, that I found helpful to, to understand um, are body, and we always start with body. I'll get to that uh, explanation in a little bit. Perception, emotion, and thought. And each one feeds the other. Okay? Now there's an interesting thing. There, there's a book out called uh, Think Fast and Slow by a man named Kahneman. And um, on the left side there, uh, body, perception, and emotion can be right away. Okay? We can react to something before we think about it. Thought is slow. Thought slows us down. Thinking involves language, and that slows us down. Okay? Um, to the extent we're thinking about what we're doing, we're not doing it very well. It actually interferes with the process. I remember um, catching a, an interview about a baseball game, and, and I, I'm not a big fan, but I happened to be walking by, and this guy was being interviewed. Apparently, he got the game running hit for a championship game. And the guy asked him, what were you thinking before you hit the ball? And he said, I wasn't thinking. If I'd been thinking, I wouldn't have hit it. <laughs> Okay, which is exactly true. And I remember my daughter uh, ran the hurdles in high school and her coach was challenging her to, to break the record. And, and there was this one race, I don't know if she beat the gun, but she just burst out ahead of everybody and, and was almost a full hurdle ahead of everybody. And it was like, whoa. And, and she said she got to the last hurdle and she says, I've just got to make sure I don't fall. <laughs> Down she went because her thought interfered with her response to the moment, okay? So when we're in balance, we can respond to the moment with our full capacity. When we're thinking about it, it throws us out of balance. Now thought serves a useful purpose, okay? But we need to do it in context where it's gonna be helpful. We need to reflect on things and learn from things and obviously the college wouldn't exist if, if we <laughs> didn't <laughs> emphasize thought, so. Um, okay. Oops, I'm going to go back. Oh, did I miss one here? Oh, okay. Um, in terms of the components um, of uh, body, my, body, perception, emotion, and thought, uh, the one part that's not up there is brain. And actually, I, I got very interested in neuroscience and just thought, wow, this is going to really inform my work and, and confirm things. And the more I looked into it, uh, the more skeptical I became, uh, particularly when I came across a quote from uh, uh, a group of neuroscience that wrote a letter to the European agency that was coordinating the new developments in neuroscience. And this man said, drawing conclusions from neuroscience at this stage of its development is the equivalent to hearing thunder and predicting where the lightning will strike. Okay? We know how lightning works, we know how thunder works, but to use it as a predictive tool, we ain't there yet, <laughs> okay? And some of this stuff is so interesting and so exciting, it's very tempting to jump ahead, and a lot of people, particularly a lot of psychologists, tend to do that, but we need to have some skepticism about that, okay? Um, it, it's pretty clear, um, in my perspective, that the medical breakthroughs are gonna come first, okay? The psychological benefits of understanding how the brain works Probably, I don't imagine it happening in my lifetime from, from my understanding of, of the work that's, that's being done and what we're capable of. Um, first of all, there, there, there's no evidence that any particular part of the brain causes a particular behavior. That's just a huge jump to put that cause in there. And uh, there, was a, there was a man, um, there was a thing on PBS a few years back, there was a man who was, who was very physically active. He was a jogger, he was an athlete, and he was in his 50s and uh, had a stroke. It was a very severe stroke. Doctors said he would never walk again. Um, his son was just starting medical school, and he dropped out of medical school to help his father. And he said, um, you know, you learned how to walk by crawling first, so let's start there. You learned how to do it one time, let's just try it. What have we got to lose? 
So he worked with his father for a couple of years, starting out crawling, okay, and eventually got him up on his feet, and he was able to walk again, and he was able to run again, and he got back into jogging. He wasn't completely back to where he was, but he was very active and had a full life and lived another 20 years, and, and then he died. And his son, by then, had graduated from medical school. He went back and he requested a full autopsy. And the part of the brain that's involved in walking and running was not there. It was mush. Okay? It was not functional. Okay? He had reworked new pathways to compensate for that. Okay? So the brain is an adaptive organ. Okay, it isn't a fixed thing. It isn't like a computer where this processor does this and this handles that. Um, it adapts, and, and people who have visual impairment find other parts of the brain that are much larger. Okay, and 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 so we adapt to to what's going on there. So uh, to say that that um, you know this part of the brain causes this it, it is based really on the major research is really measuring blood flow in the brain. Okay, they use a, an FR, fMRI that measures, measures blood flow and they also kind of measure some electrical current. Okay? Uh, but to say that because there's blood flow in this part of the brain that's causing this behavior is the equivalent of saying that embarrassment is caused by blushing. Okay? It's not caused by blushing. It's caused by me thinking I'm stupid or something like that. Okay? Um, and, but, it's, but there's a corresponding thing that's happening in the brain, which makes sense because the brain is really the coordinator in, in my understanding of it. So I think of it less as a master and more as a coordinator. So we won't be looking at a lot from the brain. We hear the term hard, hardwired a lot, and I think that's a misnomer uh, because the brain continually adapts to what's going on. And, and I can speak from personal experience because I also had a stroke uh, back in 2009. It was a actually one of the most fascinating experiences I've ever had. Um, uh, but I could feel my brain shutting down. I could feel language shutting down. And it was like I was going down this slope and I wanted to go there I mean, because it was really, there was something really intriguing about it. And I was at work and I went down to urgent care and got checked out and they called an ambulance and when I was waiting for the ambulance I just sat down and was meditating. And they, they uh, put me in the ambulance and strapped me down and um, then when they were, sirens were blaring and they were passing everyone, I realized, oh, well, I could die. And so I'm thinking, well, there's not much I can do about that. But I felt this slipping away and then I realized language is the key to my work. Okay, I need language. So I started doing mental math and started, started um, uh, just five times nine divided by four times three and just, just to occupy my brain to get it going from some reason I thought of that and then I started repeating phrases and sounds and things like that and I could feel part of my body so I just started moving and I was strapped down. So I did that all the way to the hospital. It was about a 40 minute drive because it's far up north and um, they asked me to sign my name when we got to the hospital and hand me a clipboard and it's like it wasn't there. It's like I went to a river and the bridge was out, okay, and I could not do it. And I had to practice and practice and practice for hours and then I eventually could sign my name. They asked me who the president was and I said John Kennedy. And I knew it was wrong, but it was the same thing. It was like I went to the river and the bridge was out. So then I had to go through the presidents and I finally got to the current president, okay. So and I fully recovered by doing that, but it, it taught me an important lesson about how our brain really works. It's not like a computer. That's really not a very good example of what the brain is. So, so I encourage you to take um, all of that with a little bit of skepticism. But there is something that, that we understand about the brain that actually people started talking about in the 90s that I found to be extremely valuable. And that is, is that, our, that our brain um, records, not so much records, that's not the word I want, um, reflects our experiences by creating pathways, by creating connections between neurons. That's pretty well known. And, and uh, I mean, the, the infinite number of connections available is, is outstanding. The number is bigger than what I can write on that board over there, okay? The possible connections and the way they do. But so when I saw each of you come in, okay, for example, I recognized you because I have a series of connections in my brain from Pam, 
okay, because we've talked a number of times, and so when, as soon as you walked in, that's Pam. You're probably wearing different clothes than when I met you before, and your glasses may be different, and I don't know, but I recognize you because we've had a lot of, of contact before. So anytime we have an experience, it creates a connection between a series of neurons, and then to the extent we repeat that experience, it becomes easier to access. And the more often we access it, the easier it is to find. So if you've lived in your home for any length of time, you won't have to think about how to get home tonight. Okay, you can just think about what you want for dinner or what you want to do afterwards, uh, and you'll wind up at home. Okay, if I'm going to go to your homes, I don't know where any of you live, I'll have to follow directions and look at road signs and, and figure it out, okay, because my brain doesn't have those pathways, okay. So that's an important part of our understanding, and that's the extent that we'll be talking about how the brain influences that in terms of those roadways and pathways. Okay, any questions? Okay.